Well, good morning, Soundside Church. Welcome to the online version of today's worship service. Well, I got to say it's been a great week in sports, especially if you're a baseball fan. The most exciting time of the year, baseball playoffs. I'm sad to say, however, that my childhood favorite baseball team lost in the Major League playoffs last week. And then, uh, for you locals, you know this, I watched our hometown team lose in an epic pitching duel that lasted for 18 innings. I gotta say, really, I enjoyed this season. It was an exciting comeback for my team. It was a great season. I really am thankful for all the joy that it brought. But I wanna, I gotta say that, you know, there's something about baseball this time of year. Really, it gets super exciting. It's like baseball goes through a sort of transformation. The stakes are raised. Every inning becomes like the ninth inning in a regular season game. And we get all that extra excitement day after day for weeks. It's unlike any other sport. And I know there are plenty of baseball critics out there, but I agree with the Washington Post when they say baseball turns up the pressure better than any other sport. And it happens just slow enough that you really get to see it. And if you're a fan, you kind of get to experience it vicariously. Most often we see it on the face of a pitcher or a manager. Even though they are under a lot of stress, you can be certain that they wouldn't have it any other way and they wouldn't be in any other place. There's no other place they'd rather be than right there at that moment, even if their face doesn't tell the same story. I think most pastors are doing what they love because God has put the work on their heart and a desire emerges to take stewardship and accept the pressure of church work, which is people work. But that's just what it is. It's pressure, and his concern. And that's how Paul described it in today's text. Spiritual leaders who model Christ carry the burden and they allow themselves to feel the weight of really caring for the people of God. Well, last week, Pastor Aaron asked the question, what would a pastor or spiritual leader be willing to do for free? That's a searching question. It's challenging. It opens up a complex discussion, but it does help us get closer to finding qualified leaders with the right heart to lead. And that is what we've been getting at in this series of messages entitled Mentors and Monsters. What is the character and heart of a leader we should follow under the Lord? There's a heart that mentors and there's a heart that does monstrous damage. What heart are we looking for? Would we know it if we saw it? And what are we looking for in the heart, let's say, of our next elder at Soundside? Well, it's the heart of a leader who is humble enough to identify with God's people and genuinely care about their burdens. It's the reason that Paul is talking so much about himself in this series. He's opening up. He's becoming vulnerable in a way that makes him feel quite embarrassed. He says, like a fool or like a madman, even as he believes it is critically necessary. So let's think more about the heart of a true spiritual mentor. Wouldn't it be great if Jesus described his heart to us in the scriptures? If he just came right out and said, this is what is inside here. This is what's driving me. This is where my passion is coming from. Well, he did. He said it like this. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And that jives really well with the credentials that Paul chooses to boast about in today's text. Credentials that display more weakness than strength. Not what we would expect per se. And so today, I'd like to invite you to read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 is where we're going to be today. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 16 through 33. The scripture says this, I repeat, let no one consider me a fool, but if you do, at least accept me as a fool so that I can also boast a little. What I am saying in this matter of boasting, I don't speak as the Lord would, but as it were, foolishly. Since many boast according to the flesh, I will also boast. For you, being so wise, gladly put up with fools. In fact, you put up with it if someone enslaves you, if someone exploits you, if someone takes advantage of you, if someone is arrogant toward you, if someone slaps you in the face. I say this to our shame. We have been too weak for that. But in whatever anyone dares to boast, I am talking foolishly, I also dare. 
Are any Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they the servants of Christ? I'm talking like a madman. I'm a better one, with far more labors, many more imprisonments, far worse beatings, many times near death. Five times I received 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I face dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and dangers among false brothers. Toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing. Not to mention other things, there is the daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If boasting is necessary, I will boast about my weaknesses. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows I am not lying. In Damascus, a ruler under King Aretas guarded the city of Damascus in order to arrest me, so I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. So, looking at today's text, it's a laundry list of suffering that Paul endured and continues to endure, and he shares it in the form of boasting. Since the impressive but abusive false apostles were boasting in their eloquence and domineering personalities, Paul wants to reorient the church's values by boasting in what he calls weaknesses, because they considered a suffering leader a weak leader. But that's not Christianity. And so Paul ends with an almost humorous picture of himself in a basket. Imagine that. Paul in a basket, coming down the wall in an attempt to escape arrest. Sometimes we just get it upside down when it comes to our leaders, and we need to refocus. So I'm going to make three observations from today's text about how mentors carry the burden and then three ways we can help our leaders and each other. Observation number one, mentors care about the vulnerable. We see this in verses 19 through 21 where Paul says this, For you, being so wise, gladly put up with fools. In fact, you put up with it if someone enslaves you, if someone exploits you, if someone takes advantage of you, if someone is arrogant toward you, if someone slaps you in the face. I say this to our shame. We have been too weak for that. For whatever reason, these Christians were attracted to abusive personalities. And I think we have to admit that we may at times be vulnerable to similar kinds of spiritual abuse. We have some responsibility to stop giving abusive leaders access to leadership in our churches. And we've got to stand up when abuse becomes apparent. But we should also recognize that some Christians are especially vulnerable to spiritual abuse. They can be victims of authoritarian domineering or psychological manipulation. And tragically, it can be mixed with physical and even sexual abuse. The truth is, it happens so much more often than we would like to admit. And it's not a made-up consequence of the modern Me Too movement. It's real. Certainly, a modern-day Corinthian-like American epistle written to us today would include this epidemic. I believe the Lord is looking for church members and leaders who take active notice of abuses within the church. And I believe that because he's the God who cares about the vulnerable. He stands up for the poor, the widow, the orphan, and he pronounces judgment on those who cause little ones to stumble because he's looking out for them. Well, these people, they had a leader who loved them enough to call their attention to manipulative and abusive leadership. In their case, they were inviting the abuse and were evidently in a good position to do something about it. And so Paul is calling on them to do something about it. You know, but others in an abusive situation, they aren't so fortunate. So here's the bad news for a moment. We are faced with too many stories of churches and church leaders that have compounded harm by shielding abusive people from justice, which has led to more people experiencing harm. So today we have the existence of survivor blogs and survivor movements. While they aren't perfect and we might not like everything they have to say, 
But the existence of survivor moments, I believe, is an indictment on the church that has for too long failed to protect the vulnerable. Perhaps you, like me, have personal stories where you or loved ones suffered significant harm because of this. Christians cannot be the people who are quick to dismiss abuse or look the other way. On the contrary, we should be the people who assume that vulnerability is present in the body and danger is present. How much spiritual abuse could be avoided in the church if instead of ignoring or downplaying harm, more leaders had their eyes open looking for this cancer and speaking out? Don't you long to be part of a church community that is safe when you are vulnerable, when you are weak? A community that speaks up for the vulnerable, seeks to give strength to the vulnerable, a true safe place for the vulnerable, a place where sheep can meet the great shepherd who carries the rod and provides rest for souls. Our attitude toward other human beings, no matter the religious or political or ethnic or any other identity, is in a gospel that says, when we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. We are a people who instinctively move toward the vulnerable to protect because we were vulnerable and weak and failing and without strength. And Christ moved toward us. He left the place of holiness to put on weakness so that we could, he could meet us where we were and deliver us to a place of safety. The gospel has brought us from peril and into safety. And I believe this is true about our church and I'm thankful for it. I think we need to strive that it continues to be this way. When people walk into a church that is living the gospel, they experience an effect of the gospel before they even believe the gospel. Don't we long for our churches to be places that are safe from harm? This is what the church has always done when at its best, the formation of orphanages and hospitals and abolition movements, and we could go on. But what is the need of this hour? We need mentors who care when members are getting slapped in the face, so to speak. It's an important mark. And that's our first observation today. Second observation comes from verse 23. And I think it's pretty obvious as we looked at that long list. It was almost humorous the way that he just lists these one right after the other. But that is mentors endure hardship. Look at verse number 23. With far more labors, many more imprisonments, far worse beatings, many times near death. And then he goes on to list a whole host of things that he endured and suffered in the course of his ministry up to this point. There's a mixture of religious persecution in this list and hardships from other causes. And admittedly, it's difficult to relate to Paul given our free and prosperous situation. Maybe our road travel might be as dangerous as his sea travel, maybe not. But even so, at some level, the people we allow to have spiritual influence over us must be willing to make sacrifices to be inconvenienced, to endure unfair gossip or occasional mistreatment by the very people one is called to serve. We are all called to this as a church, but our leaders need to model it, and we need to look for leaders who model this. I want to make a note about cultural pressure and public scorn. It is indeed possible in our country for pastors to receive negative public attention for something they've said or something that their church believes. It does happen. It's important to mention that Paul labored to make sure his audience knew he cared about them in his messaging. He bent over backwards so that he would not unnecessarily cause offense and lay an unnecessary obstacle to the reception of the gospel. So he famously said, I became all things to all men. And yet, he suffered anyway. I've heard some leaders ridicule others who are cautious with their words and emotions, saying something like, well, you're going to get persecuted anyway, so your attempt to be inoffensive is just in vain. It's not worth the time and the effort. But I want us to see that Paul boldly preached the gospel while at the same time caring a great deal about unnecessary obstacles. So I don't want in this discussion to endorse leaders who, without care, make provocative and insensitive statements that land them constantly in the hot seat usually because they're just plain being unkind or ungracious. Persecution is not automatically a badge of honor, is what I'm trying to say. But it is so in the case of a leader who simply finds himself enduring hardship 
in the course of faithful ministry, the kind that Paul describes in this text. He did not shrink back from gospel ministry and doing what it took to get, get to people across the globe. And in so doing, he faced a great deal of painful obstacles. And like a true spiritual mentor, he pressed on in the strength of Christ and he still refused to give up. We could add to the question that we had last time, what would a pastor do for free? This question, what would a pastor be willing to endure for the sake of the gospel and God's people? That's an important mark as well. In an era where so many on the celebrity and political level are concerned about image and follower counts and book sales and public embarrassment, pastors face the real temptation to avoid suffering or discomfort when ministry gets costly. And not just pastors, but all of us. From a strictly human perspective, it's hard to imagine that anyone would choose the life of hardship that Paul describes in this passage. You could argue it would be better to sit in the execution chair and just get it over with rather than go through a life like this. And yet Paul lacked no joy. He willingly embraced the life and even offers, offers it as a, as a grounds for boasting in contrast to the boasting of these arrogant, abusive leaders. So why did he endure? Why does the true spiritual mentor endure? What should the church look for in its leaders? Leaders who endure hardship for the sake of the church's pure devotion to Jesus and the gospel. Paul's laundry list of weaknesses showcases just how good the gospel is. I'm going to tell you how bad I've had it so you can see how good the gospel must be if I continue believing it and spreading it. And so that's the second observation. True spiritual mentors, the kind of people we should look for and follow and even a, and, uh, try to be ourselves, is people who are willing to endure hardship for the sake of the gospel. Third observation, mentors shoulder pressure. I want you to read verses 28 and 29 with me and see what I think is the pastor's heart in a nutshell. Verse number 28, Paul says, not to mention other things, there is the daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? Shouldering, shouldering pressure is a choice that Paul made and he didn't have to do it. I know I would be tempted to say, you know what? I'm a messenger from Jesus and I delivered my message. These people have been really mean to me and said some really mean things about the way that I talk and I've got to move on. You know, the truth is sometimes we do have to move on and pastors do have to move on and members do have to move on, but not before we've shouldered the burden and not before we believe the Lord is calling us to lay it down. We accept the burden and the responsibility to care for others. Spiritual mentors should uniquely model this, but it's easy to see how this is a calling that we all share. A lot of modern pastoral thinking stresses self-care and some measure of emotional detachment from the flock. I remember being told at one point in my training that pastors can't have close friends in the churches that they lead. And I remember that being a somewhat common viewpoint. The reason for this was that ultimately people would too easily see the flaws in their pastor. Another reason was that pastors would too often suffer pain when a friend chooses to leave the church and in so doing leaves the friendship. And I'm sure there were other reasons I don't remember. But in contrast, I remember my first mentor in ministry explaining that he couldn't justify that kind of distance between the pastor and the people. And I agree with him. Even if it presented challenges and times of hurt and pain, it was worth it long term for himself and the church to connect with the people of God. I heard another pastor say that even though love brings pain, we still continue to love. And I can say that in some 17 years of ministry, I found some of my best friendships in the churches I've served in. And I found it beneficial for me, for my own accountability and my own growth. And it's good for others to see the, the cracks in the armor, so to speak, the chinks in the armor of the elder, to see the flaws and to assist and to aid, to help him become more like Christ. Aaron and I as elders here at Soundside feel what Paul says here. When Paul says, I feel pressure. I feel concern. You know, one might piously say, well, Paul, maybe you should cast all your cares on Jesus. And the truth is, 
He should, just like we should. But that doesn't mean that as a spiritual leader, he shouldn't feel the pressure and concern. That's how God intends it to be. Your elders here practice and attempt to practice Sabbath, and we attempt to carve out family time. But the truth is there's no off switch when it comes to our care and our concern and the pressure in the ministry. Thank God we're not responsible for all the churches, but we ache when we know someone is struggling. We burn with frustration and anger against the enemy when someone is led into stumbling and the resulting consequences of sinful choices. We lose sleep when there is even a hint of division in the church. That's a big deal to us. We feel things physically, as do all those whom God has called to shepherd his flock. Why does Soundside Church need to hear this? It's not because we're looking for sympathy. I mean, the truth is, we've got it really good at this church. We serve in a great church with great people who understand these things. The church needs to hear this for the sake of all those whom God may yet call to serve in this church or in the churches you may find yourself in in the future. We want you to know this. Your pastors love you and desperately want to love you the way that we should love you. And that's what the pressure and concern should indicate, right? Love for the people. And of course, we all carry some level of pressure and concern for the people in our church body because we love them and we want to love them. Pastors can't do all that must be done, perhaps only a small fraction. And as record numbers reportedly are fleeing pastoral ministry, the church needs more than ever to raise up true spiritual mentors who care about the vulnerable, are willing to endure hardship, and willing to carry the burden and feel the pressure. If modern professional ministry wants to distance itself from this burden of identifying with the people of God, it is simply rejecting what Paul embraced as a mark of his ministry, as a grounds for boasting. So two ways we can actively help our leaders and each other, and I'll close with this. Number one, let's let the leaders be weak. Now, I'm not saying select poor leaders, but perhaps the leader we need is not the flashy leader, the smooth or the eloquent speaker, the impressive personality. We need leaders who are willing to get into the trenches, grab a shovel, and get their hands dirty. And if they're enduring pressure and you get close enough, guess what? You're going to see cracks. And this is a different kind of weakness than Paul is really talking about in this passage, but he talks about it in other places, maybe the next chapter. You're going to see flaws. And we should expect to see flaws. And pastors need to know that they can share their flaws with people without necessarily destroying their ability and capacity to lead. If we don't expect flaws we will set up our leaders to fail. I watched a pastor resign after years of needing help because he didn't believe he could be helped without causing harm and disappointing the community. Well, guess what happened in the end? He caused harm and he disappointed the community. But I don't believe it had to be that way. It's easy to blame the leader in that situation, and many did, but I think we can help. We can help by building a church culture that doesn't place leaders on so high a pedestal of perfection that they can't get help when they need it. And our leaders need to know that we expect them to ask for help, even if it's embarrassing or perhaps even risky. So that's one thing. Let's let the leaders be weak. And finally, number two, let's carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Why wouldn't this also mean that we can help our mentors shoulder the daily pressure? There are lots of small ways we can do this, and it's the kind of things that fit right into the calling that we all share. So let me close today by sharing how the members of Soundside Church do this so well all the time. Church, you notice vulnerable people and you move in to help. When someone's been missing a while, You'll send a text or you'll set up a meetup or find some other way to connect. Or you'll, you'll mention it to one of us as the pastors and say, hey, could you check on them? You see someone sitting by themselves in the service. I've seen this several times. They're sitting by themselves in the service and you go sit next to them. You check in with someone to find out how their struggle the previous week played out. This happened last week. You tell people, you tell someone that their headlight is out and that you'd like to go take a look at it. God's been working on your heart about serving in a leadership position in the church. 
and you decide it's time that you step up to the plate. You share the pressure. You help to share the burden. And your church is better for it. You all are better for it. So what we want to say today from the bottom of our hearts to Soundside Church is this. Our, our family, thank you so much. Let's pray. Father, I pray, God, that you'll bless this message for your glory. God, that you would, you, you would use it and you would call it to remembrance when we need it, especially when it's time for us to select the next elder of Soundside Church. And God, I pray that you would help us to be the kind of people who look out for and protect and stand up for the vulnerable, the kind of people who are willing, when necessary, to endure hardship for the sake of the church and the gospel. And Lord, people who share the pressure and the burden, willingly and gladly. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.